Good morning, y'all. Well, afternoon, whatever. I don't know. Jeez. <laughs> Didn't know y'all were critics. <laughs> Let's stand our feet. If y'all want, uh, uh, y'all can lay down and sleep. Uh, yeah, we're going to do some songs. We're going to have a good old time, y'all. Okay. Okay. Thank you, and good Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning to Christiansburg Baptist family. Thank you for the faithful who uh, 
have uh, flexed and obeyed, because there's no other way, okay, to be happy in Jesus but to flex and obey. So thanks for y'all for flexing and being a part of uh, this worship service today uh, with the crazy weather coming upon us. So um, let me get my, act, get my act together here. Uh, we're glad you're here. And uh, for anyone watching online this afternoon or on Sunday morning. Uh, one of the things that I love is uh, the way God's word is just often validated in our just day-to-day -day things. And um, our scripture today is taken from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 through 11. And this is when God has taken the children of Israel out of Egypt. But not only did he have to take the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had to take Egypt out of the children of Israel. And so that's one of the things that he did there at Mount Sinai. And um, he gave them a whole new calendar. He gave them uh, a new law. He gave them a legal system. He gave them a social system. He gave them all of these things because they had been in captivity for 400 years, and every somebody else had been making decisions and all for them. And one of the things he does in Exodus, of course, Exodus um, chapter 20, y'all should recognize that, is the uh, Ten Commandments. And one of those had to do with uh, designating the, the Sabbath. And so... Uh, here we go, verse 8, he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day, the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You shall, you or your servants or your daughters or your male servants or your female servant or your livestock or or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And, you know, in our culture today, uh, I mean, some of y'all can remember that um, when you were kids, we had blue laws, and you didn't go to the store on Sunday, and we really honored the Sabbath in our, in our culture. And uh, I ran across a fascinating article this week that um, really kind of validated what, uh, what God was doing. Uh, this, it says, uh, for the brain to thrive, you can't spend all your time working, writes uh, Jay Dix of the Neuroleadership Institute. Human beings aren't robots, and overwork leads to burnout disengagement, and resignations. More than that, he says, the brain requires downtime, unstructured time with no goal in mind and no targeted focus of attention. So if some of y'all are like me and you feel like if you're just sitting idle that you're not doing anything productive, wrong, okay? And uh, by contrast, he explains, an important half of our brain lights up and makes new connections when we're actually at rest, which helps foster innovation and creativity. So is it any wonder that God created the Sabbath for us with the intention that we focus on him and we disengage from the rest of our life and clear our minds? So tomorrow, as it's snowing, you're perfectly free to sit there in awe and look at those snowflakes coming down and just think of how awesome God is and rest your mind because that's going to help you in the coming week, okay? So we need to keep each other accountable for things like that. Now let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we will, um, as appropriate. Heavenly Father, we just praise your name, and we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you that your grace is enough, and we experience, all the people of the world experience your common grace, but we have blessed, been blessed with your grace of your special revelation, and that's in this word that we have in our hands, and your son, Jesus. We 
truly, we acknowledge that we truly do owe you every breath that we take, Lord. And so, uh, Father, we commit this day to you. We thank you for those who have been uh, faithful to, to be flexible and uh, make this worship service possible. We pray for um, <clears throat> those who have to be working. Think about uh, David Haskins and uh, his buddies who will be uh, driving plows tomorrow. We pray for their safety. Pray for our uh, highway patrol first responders and all who are going to have to be out in the weather. And yet we thank you for this uh, technology that uh, allows us to be able to uh, uh, record this message and, uh, and for it to be replayed tomorrow for those who are not uh, available today. Lord, um, we know there's others who we need to keep in prayer and diligently lift up. And uh, so we pray for those in the hospital like Mike. And uh, we uh, pray for the families. Uh, this time has just pr presented so many um, conflicts, so many um, anxieties in people's hearts, Lord. And we know that uh, only you can help to calm those. Lord, um, we, you have commanded that we be diligent in prayer for our leaders. And uh, we thank you today, Lord. Uh, we give praise for uh, our new governor and uh, lieutenant governor and attorney general, Lord, who are all believers. Thank you for that uh, very strong prayer of invocation at the inaugural. And I thank you for the boldness of a governor who's willing to close the entire ceremony in prayer, personal prayer to you, Lord, recognizing that uh, there is only one power that we can call upon to make right decisions. I pray that uh, we as a people, Lord, would be a light. Uh, this state that was the home of religious freedom, Lord, would be a light uh, to the rest of the world, Lord, for uh, um, unity and um, pray for revival in your church, Lord, because we know that that is where change takes place, is in the hearts of your people. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing on this gathering. We pray for Pastor Sean as he brings the word. We thank you for our praise team as uh, they offer uh, the leadership in the area of music. And uh, we thank you for those uh, caring for our young ones. We just want to give you the praise and the glory for this day, Lord. And it's in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's stand to our feet. Do a couple more songs before Pastor Sean gets up here and poaches at us. <laughs> We did this song last Sunday. Let's see if y'all listen to it. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what the Savior has done. See how his love overcomes, he has done great things, yes, he has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you freed every captain and break every chain, oh God, you have done great Storm. You'll be faithful 
The world. 
folks cry to find no breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no steam of pray with me. Father, there's a lot of days where we're tired, we're frustrated, maybe we've been falling into sin and we're just tired of fighting with it. Thank you that it's in the power of Christ we stand. Not in our own strength, not in our own wisdom, not in our own righteousness, but in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We can stand. We can stand firm and do what you've called us to do because you give us the strength. We can obey. We can rejoice. We can hold on to hope. All in the power of Christ. Thank you for that today. Now would you speak to us from your word. Remind us of the great and awesome God you are and help us to see any areas where we may be blind. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, go ahead and be seated this afternoon or morning if you're watching us online. Although, I imagine if you're watching us online, you probably didn't stand up in your living room. (laughs) You may have, though. Well, at this time, we do want to go ahead and dismiss our kindergarten through fifth grade. Back on with Miss Margie, who's going to go back. Uh, Mike already alluded to it, but guys, none of this would have been possible today if it were not for the incredible group of fluid volunteers that I just mentioned to you last week. Remember I was saying, I'm so grateful that our church family's fluid. Well, you guys have had to do it this Sunday or Saturday, whichever one it is, and we're glad that you guys have been so fluid with us. So thank you to all of our volunteers who shifted their schedule around. Thank you folks who came out on Saturday, and if you couldn't be here and you're watching us online on Sunday, we totally understand and glad you're with us, okay? Now, go ahead and open your Bibles up, if you have them, to John chapter 9. We are resuming our study of John. We started last week back in kind of jumped ahead a little bit into John 14, but we're going back to where we were before we took a break there in John chapter 9. Now, let me remind you, by the way, as we're doing this, uh, we are have the privilege of preparing our messages this right now during this season with several other pastors from several other churches. And this week, as we were talking about it, there was another church that's already preached this passage, and they brought to my attention a syndrome or a disease that I had never heard of before. Have any of you ever heard of something called Anton syndrome? Anybody ever heard of that? It's incredibly rare. In fact, there's only been 28 diagnosed cases in all of human history. It's a really interesting and very odd disorder. What happens is usually something like a stroke or some kind of trauma to the brain causes a person to go physically blind. Their brain can no longer see. However, in the course of that stroke or that trauma or injury, whatever it is, in incredibly rare situations, the part that tells their brain whether or not they can see gets messed up as well. So although they're completely blind, bumping into stuff, need help dressing, they think that they can still see. They gave the account, as you read through, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's called Anton Syndrome, for those who are interested. Or um, I've got the link to a journal article that I understood about every third word in. So if you're a little bit more like Paul or like uh, Gina or somebody, or Brooke, you know, who got a little bit more background in medical things, you might understand it better than I did. Um, But as you read through it, you find like there was a a nobleman back in the day, late late 1700s, early 1800s, excuse me, who just 
absolutely refused to acknowledge that he was blind. They give an example of an 80-something-year-old woman who had a stroke, and, and although all of the tests indicated that she was fully blind and she bumped into things and she needed help dressing and, and she could eat if she could find her silverware on the tray, but she needed help scooping that last few bites of food because she was physically blind, but mentally she could not acknowledge that she couldn't see. Now, there are few pictures in life that are more accurate to what we're going to see today than that idea of Anton syndrome. Jesus in John chapter 9 is going to be talking to several individuals who are blind, and some of them know it, but most of them don't. So as we look through John chapter 9, I want you to go through this story with me. Now, when we say story, by the way, we don't mean made up fictitious tale. This is a real event that actually happened. And this is an account of how Jesus encountered a man who was born blind and how he went about healing him and in a very unusual and extraordinary way in the conversations that follow. And as we do that, my question for you today is, are you blind enough to see Jesus? Now, how many of you need glasses or contacts in this room? Okay? All right. My, mine are bad enough that I am not, I'm not like legally blind, but you would not want me to operate a motor vehicle without my contacts in. Okay? Um, I think like I'm a negative six in this eye, negative five in that eye, if that means anything to you. Um, I'm to the level where I have to pay for the more expensive lenses. Otherwise, they actually are so wide, they break. I, got, I tried to, to, to push it one time, and so the cheap pair of glasses I have as my backup pair has a crack that runs right through the middle of them because the lenses are so thick that they just don't hold together, okay? So I, I have a little taste of what it'd be. There, there are a lot of days, I remember as a teenager, where I'd lay in bed, and I'd sit there and think, God, I know you can heal my eyes. You could make me see. Nope, still not there. One of these days, I'm going to wake heaven and I'm going to see perfectly and it's not going to feel all gloopy and I'm not going to have to worry. It's going to be wonderful. I can't wait for that day. But here's, we're going to run into at least three different people or three different groups that are dealing with various levels of blindness. There's a man here that we're going to talk about who's physically blind. Then we're going to also see the disciples who have a little bit of a trace of spiritual blindness, but really we're going to see the spiritual blindness played out most readily in the Pharisees this morning. Now, remember, the Pharisees were the religious leaders. These were the guys who knew God's word, they knew the Bible, and they had it all nailed out to where they knew exactly what they should do and what they shouldn't do, but it was all external. It wasn't about being right with God through a relationship of love with him. Instead, it was, if I do all the good things and don't do all the bad things, then surely I'm going to be right with God. And what we're going to see is those living that kind of life are blind, not blind enough to see Jesus. All right? Now, if you look at this chapter, you can look through it and see it's pretty long. We're going to cover the entire thing today, all right? So uh, for those of you who are thinking, well, great, glad I can fast forward this. Um, We're doing it as a playback, so actually I don't think you can fast forward, so ha. No, what we're going to try to do is we're going to take some time and we're going to go ahead and summarize what the the story is, that go through the the passage. I would encourage you, if we don't have time to hit all the nuances of it, but I'd encourage you to go back and read it this week because the guy gets really sarcastic with the Pharisees and it's fantastic. Like it's, it's an absolutely beautiful moment. But I'm going to try to tell you the story. We're going to kind of go through, and then as we do after that, we're going to make some observations about the fact that we ourselves are blind, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done, we can regain our sight, okay? So start with me here in verse 1, and we'll kind of skip through, and so you can just kind of follow along with me. As he was passing by, and this is talking about Jesus as he was going about teaching, they encounter a man who was born blind. He had been blind his entire life. He's an adult, as we'll find out later in the text. So he's at least probably, what, about 20 years old, if longer. And so as the disciples look at this man who was born blind, they ask Jesus a question. So this guy was born blind, right? Who sinned? Was it him or his parents? See, the idea was, if this guy was blind, somebody had to have done something wrong. Look at Jesus' response here in verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. So Jesus said, nobody sinned. It's so that God could demonstrate his works. He's been at least 20 years blind, and it was all so that this moment could happen. What does Jesus do? Well, he does something very unusual to us. As he's standing there, he's talking, and and he responds to the disciples, said, nope, nobody sinned. This guy was just born blind so that God's works could be displayed. Then he does something unusual. He spits in the dirt and makes mud out of it, and he takes it, 
and he puts it on the man's eyes. Now, this is the only time that we see Jesus healing in this particular way. We don't know for sure why he did it this way, but he did. And he tells the man to go off to the pool of Siloam, which featured heavily in chapter 6. That's a real important part of chapter 6 that we talked about. When he goes off, he washes in the pool of Siloam, and he comes back, and he's seeing. Now, his neighbors and the others around him say, wait, is this the guy that was born blind? And some people are saying, yeah, that was him. And others say, no, that couldn't have been him because he can see now. And, and he says, no, I was the guy that was born blind. That, that's me. Well, then they, they say, well, how did you get to see? Well, he tells them, I, he put mud on my eyes. I went off and I washed and I came back and I could see. Then they said, well, you got to go to the Pharisees. So they take him to the Pharisees and the Pharisees say, all right, give glory to God. How on earth did you see? And he said, look, this guy, he, he, he made mud and he washed my eyes. Oh, there was a problem though. We know this guy has to be a sinner. You know why? Because he did this on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day you weren't allowed to do any work. And here Jesus was doing this work, making mud, calling this guy to wash it off. He was healing on the Sabbath. That guy has to be a sinner. Who do you think he is? The man replies, I think he's a prophet. No, there's no way he's a prophet. So then the Pharisees start thinking, maybe this whole thing's a hoax. And so they say, I don't even think this guy was the guy that was born blind. So they call his mom and dad in. And they say, hey, mom and dad, is this your son? Was he born blind? How did he get to see? They said, well, yeah, that's our son. But they were scared of the Pharisees. So they said, yeah, that's our son. He was blind. We don't know how he got to see. You got to ask him. He's of age. They didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. So they were afraid to tell the Pharisees what happened. So they come to the guy and they say, all right, tell us straight. How is it that you saw I love it. This is where it starts getting good. Verse 26, they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, he said, you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? <laughs> I love it. Sticking it to him. It's great. They ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. This is an amazing thing, I told him. You don't know where he was from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, I've never heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. You were born entirely in sin, they said, and they kicked him out of the synagogue. Boy, what an interesting day. Then read with me as Jesus meets him after he gets kicked out by the Pharisees. Jesus heard that they had thrown up the man, verse 35. When they found him, he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him, he asked. Jesus answered, you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshiped him. Now listen, this is where we get our key idea this morning. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The Pharisees weren't blind enough to see Jesus. The blind man was. So what about us? What do we do with this story? Well, the first thing that I want you to acknowledge from this as we look at this is that you and I are blind. You and I are blind. Now, this gentleman was physically blind. That's kind of the whole story around it. But the reality is, apart from a true relationship with Jesus Christ, you and I are blind. We can't see whether we acknowledge it or not. One of my great fears is that there's a lot of people who are walking around with Anton syndrome spiritually. They're walking around and they think they see, they think they understand, but in reality, they've never truly come to know the God who makes us able to see. So the first thing we see is we're blind, maybe not physically, but I think you can see at least two different ways that we can be blinded spiritually just out of this text. The first one is what we see in the little bit of blindness that's left over in the disciples. Now, they had a relationship with Jesus. They were learning who he was. And so we see in them that they were blinded by misunderstanding God's ways. They were blinded by misunderstanding God's ways. When we talk about God's ways, we're talking about the way God does things. Think about it back here in verse 1. We see that they come upon this man. They know that he's been born blind, and they say, so who sinned? Was it this guy or was it his parents? 
They had this understanding that if something was wrong with somebody, it's obviously because they did something wrong, right? Now, this was something that was taught, yes, but at the same time, I want you to think of this in terms of the popular concepts in the culture of who God is and how he works. This was kind of the pop culture relationship with God. Obviously, this guy did something wrong, so bad things are happening to him. Either he did something wrong or his parents did something wrong. Now, by the way, very interesting question that they ask, right? He w- when, when did he go blind? From birth. What did they ask? Who sinned? His parents or him? He was born blind, guys. Like, now, maybe the teaching was, or maybe the idea was that God blinded him because of some sin he was going to commit later on. They, they, you know, maybe that's what they were thinking. Either way you look at it, they misunderstood God's ways. See, they should have known very clearly from the Bible that that's not how God operates. The, the clearest example of this is in the book of Job. If you've never read it, it's a tough book for, to read because you have Job who, as the story opens, is this incredibly good man. He's so righteous that when his kids have a party, he actually offers sacrifices on their behalf just in case they sinned during the party and he wants to seek God's forgiveness for them just in case something happened. He's a good man. In fact, he's so good that God allows Satan to take everything from him. Now, let me run that by you again. He's so good that God allows Satan to take everything from him. In a matter of moments, all of his children die in a terrible accident. In a matter of moments, his servants and his sheep and his camels and everything he owns, basically, his entire fortune is carried off. Everything's wiped. A short time later, God even allows Satan to inflict him with painful boils that went from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. I scraped my shin the other day, and I wanted to whine about it for a couple of hours, right? Yet here Job is inflicted with painful sores over every square inch of his body. Why? Because he was a good man who loved God. See, from the very beginning, by the way, the story of Job probably took place somewhere around Abraham's time. So from the very beginning of God's relationship with his people, they knew that bad things don't always happen to bad people and good things don't always happen to good people, that we live in a world that is wrecked by sin. And so because of that, even good people get sick and even bad people prosper. If they had understood God's word, they would have understood God's way. Now, we may sit here and say, we're, we're better than that. We, we don't understand it that way. But, you know, honestly, I think we still struggle with that same thing. Sometimes we see somebody that we know has lived a pretty rough life, and we hear that they got cancer or that they've had a stroke or that this has happened to them or they lost their business. And you know that there's a part of you that says, well, they got what they had coming for them. Right? Or then the table's turned and we get the diagnosis or we lose the job, or we lose the money, or we lose the relationship. And we say, but, but God, I, I've been good. I've done good things. Why are bad things happening to me? We've taken the Eastern idea of karma and, and tried to apply that to our life, that if I do good things, good things will happen to me, and if I do bad things, bad things will happen to me. Now listen to me, guys. God honors and blesses those who follow him. There's no question, but it's not a promise or guarantee that nothing bad will ever happen to you. The idea that if I follow God and good things are going to happen and I'm not going to get as sick as everybody else or I'm not going to have any financial hardship or relationship struggles and my marriage is going to be awesome and my job is going to be great, none of that is biblical. In fact, I'll tell you that following Jesus is one of the most difficult things you'll ever do. And you actually bring additional hardship onto yourself by following him. See, that's one of the lies that our culture teaches us that causes us to be blinded to who God is as we misunderstand his ways. We could give other examples. How many of you could tell me the reference in the Bible where it says, God helps those who help themselves? You ever heard somebody say that? You know where that comes from? Benjamin Franklin. 
That's not scripture. Benjamin Franklin was not a believer. He did not follow Jesus. He was fascinated by George Whitfield's preaching, but he never surrendered to Christ as far as we know. In fact, that statement is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that God heals the blind, that God helps the helpless. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they're the ones who will inherit the kingdom of heaven, right? Blessed are those who are willing to acknowledge their need. That's what this whole story is about. The Pharisees thought that they were the ones that were helping themselves, and so God would help them. But Jesus said, you're blind and you don't even know it. If you would acknowledge your blindness, then you could be freed from your sin, but you won't even acknowledge it, and so you're blind and don't even know it. You misunderstand God's ways. There's other ways we do this. Like I said, there's the idea that I shouldn't get sick if I'm a Christian, or I shouldn't have a hard time if I'm a Christian, or that guy should get what he's got coming to him. You know, there's all those kind of things. There's the idea of God helps those who help themselves. I thought of some other examples as we go through it. Uh, let's see, we're thinking, we mentioned one last week. We're all God's children, right? You heard somebody say that? We're all God's children. You've heard the concept maybe of the universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. That's not a biblical concept. Now, it is a biblical concept that every human being is created in the image of God and because of that has inherent value, dignity, and worth regardless of their developmental status, regardless of age, regardless of ability to contribute to society, regardless of their race or any other dividing line you want to put in place. All human beings are created with equal value and dignity before God. But Bible says only those who are his are his children doesn't speak of the universal fatherhood of God. Our culture does. And so sometimes we're blinded by misunderstanding God's ways because we look at what the culture says. Or, you know, things like God wants me to be happy or God says that we're not supposed to judge people. Well, both of those things have kernels of truth in them. There is, you know, Matthew 7 talks about being cautious when you offer judgment against other people and it's not my job to condemn others. But at the same time, all of those statements take just that little bit of biblical truth and pull it out of context and apply it to situations that are not what God intended. So one of the things that you and I need to do is step back and say, what do I believe about God and about the way that God works that's shaped more by what I hear on TV, what I read in those blogs, what my, my grandfather, who was a good Christian man, always said? Now, guys, listen, I hope that you had a godly line in, that has preceded you, but I'm going to be honest that there are times when I've heard people say, you know, my grandfather was a God, good Christian man, that that meant he went to church but didn't necessarily have a real relationship with Jesus. Like, I, I want my kids, and should God allow me to, to live long enough to have grandkids, I want them to say, my dad passionately loved Jesus, not just was a good Christian man. You know what I'm saying? You know the difference? See, a lot of times we take these cultural ideas, the pop culture theology, and it's referred to as some as moralistic therapeutic deism, <laughs> stuff to make you feel happy and to make it seem like, you know, there's a God out there and he's happy with you if you do the right thing and he'll be mad at you if you do the wrong. Guys, that makes us blind to who God really is. Now, the disciples handled it correctly because you know how they did it? They asked Jesus a question and they listened to how Jesus responded. So if you are sitting here wondering, what of my life have I taken that's my culture's idea of who God is versus what God says, then the part of the antidote to that is spending time in God's word, reading what God actually says, learning who God actually is, not just who Oprah says he is or somebody that's on the show, right? Here's the thing, though. It's not just enough for you and I to spend time in God's word. You know how I know that? Because that other group that was blind, the Pharisees that were there that day knew the Bible inside and out better than you and I ever will. And yet, even though they knew it, they were blinded by a misunderstanding of God's word. The disciples were blinded by a misunderstanding of God's ways, perhaps, from the culture, but even though the Pharisees knew the Bible, they were the second thing we see, which is blinded by misunderstanding God's word. Go back again to verses 13 and 14. This is after they find out that this man who was born blind has been healed. Okay, now 
pause for just a second. If I walked in here today and told you that somebody out in the parking lot had rubbed mud in my eyes and I went and washed and now I no longer need my contacts, which I've had glasses since I was about seven, okay? How would you respond to that? Like, if it was, like, verifiable, like, you're like, this, this is for real. Like, he actually can see. Like, God really healed him. How would you respond to that? Please, with joy, right? With excitement, with, with enthusiasm, praising God for what he's done. So how did the religious leaders do it? He did it on the Saturday, Right? At no point do the Pharisees ever rejoice that this guy who's been blind for his entire life can now see. At no point do they rejoice in that. Some of them are are willing to say, well, maybe Jesus is a prophet, but at the same time, they're so mad that he broke their understanding of the Sabbath that they can't even see what God's done. Now, this is a challenge for us church folks. And guys, everything I'm getting ready to say, I point the finger at myself as well, right? Anytime I point one at you, there's three pointing back at me, right? As I'm saying this, one of the things that you and I have to be very cautious of is thinking that because we've been in Bible studies, because we've done this, because we even came out to church on a Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock because our crazy pastor decided to have church on Saturday, that somehow that that's what's made you right with God. And that when people don't follow your exact understanding of the Bible, that they can't be right with God. See, the scariest thing for me as a pastor is that somebody would sit here week after week after week. They'd go to our Sunday school classes and hear God's word. They'd be part of small groups. They'd come to any events that we have and that they would still go to hell because they'd never come into a right relationship with God. That they somehow walked out of here blinded to the fact that you cannot heal yourself. You cannot save yourself. No matter how many Sundays your attendance card has been punched, right? No matter how much you've given, no matter how much you've done, it's not about you. You cannot make yourself right with God. Now, see, here's, I think, the danger for a lot of us. I would say probably looking out at this room and who's here today and the stories I know, most of you guys have that kind of relationship with Jesus where you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and was raised so that you could have new life and you've trusted him and him alone. So you've been made spiritually alive. You've been given sight, you can see, as we'll talk about in a minute. But I'm afraid there's times where we either put on blinders or whatever, and we start acting like the Pharisees. Now, keep in mind, the Bible said, even Mike read the passage this morning, we were not supposed to work on the Sabbath. That's a command that God gave his people. The problem was the Pharisees had come up with all kinds of legalistic things about what was and was not work. If Jesus had, if this guy had been dying and Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath, it would have been okay. But the problem was, in their mind, this is literally how they would have looked at this. He's been blind for like 38 years. One more day is not going to hurt. Just do it tomorrow. Because today's the Sabbath. He doesn't have to be healed today. And so for you to heal him on the Sabbath, that's work. That's how how narrow their focus had become. Now, guys, here's my challenge for us. We can all do this, myself included, okay? Again, I'm pointing this at me. I want you to hear it. I'm wrestling through these things as well. I can get used to the way that I like to hear somebody preach or the way I like the music to be done or the way I like the building to look or the ministry to this or to this or to this or to this. And I can get so caught up in my preferences that when I see somebody that's not doing what I think they ought to be doing, that I start judging them. And I'm blind to the fact that God's at work there. How sad would it be if we as a church missed out on something God wanted to do because it felt too different to us? Now, guys, listen. Sin is sin, okay? 
There are times when it's right for us to stand up and call out and say, this is not right. This is not God honor. There, we will always uphold the word of God as our only source of faith and practice. This is it. This is the inerrant, infallible word of God. And anything in it is true. And what he tells me to do, I'm called to do. What I'm supposed to stop doing, I will stop doing. That commitment will never change. We will make sure that our teaching is always grounded in God's word and grounded in the understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But my question is, how do we handle people who look different? People who act different? People who say different or sing different? Now, guys, if they're teaching or preaching things that go contrary to God's word, that's something to address. But, I don't want us to become blind to what God's doing because we narrow our focus. By the way, I can say this today because there's literally, I don't really think anything in my mind that's a specific example of this. So if you're sitting there saying, oh, well, Sean's thinking about that. Not really. I'm thinking about the tendency of my human heart to get solidified, to look rigidly at things. And I imagine if that's my tendency, it's probably yours as well at some level. The Pharisees had done that so much that they had completely lost their sense of compassion. They lost the ability to see God at work. Now, for them, it had become such a severe deal that they weren't even saved. They had never surrendered to Christ, and it had blinded them from their need for a relationship with God. And that may be you too. You need to examine, am I right with God based off what Jesus has done or have I been trying to do this all off of my understanding? See, without a proper understanding of God's ways and God's word, we're blind. And even when God makes us spiritually alive and we can see again, there's times when we put blinders back on or we close our eyes. We may miss what God's doing around us. But that's not how the story ends for most, is it? See, we are blind, but the second part of this is we can regain our sight. We can regain our sight. How? How does it happen that the blind man is made well? I love this. Go back to verse 1. Read through verse 1 and 2 there where you're sitting. If you need to, keep reading down to verse 5. Just kind of read through it real quick. Skim through it. What did the blind man say to get Jesus to heal him? What did he say? Nothing. You know, there's nothing in this text that tells us that the blind man asked to be healed. There's nothing in this passage that indicates that he called out to Jesus. In fact, it seems like just the opposite. It seems like the disciples were going past him and he was a well-known beggar. They knew his situation. So they said, hey, what happened to this guy? And Jesus said, oh yeah, by the way, Go see. By the way, I, I wrestled with this this week. How many of you picture Jesus really somber when he does this? I mean, be honest. Like, we all have this idea of this dignified Jesus, you know, who kind of carried this air about him, and he, he wasn't frivolous. But do you think when he told the guy to go wash, you think it was this stern command, go wash? Or was it, all right, Go wash that off. Come back, tell me what you see. Do you think there was joy in Jesus when he did this? Or was it just a somber, thou shalt go, right? Like, I, I don't want to dismiss him. I don't want to bring it down. If anything, I want to exalt your idea of who Jesus is because I imagine that there's joy where he says, look, no, 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 there was nothing wrong. By the way, you wonder how many times those parents sat there and thought, what did we do wrong that our son was born this way? How many times did he sit there and say, what did mom and dad do that made me live like this? How many times did he ask that question? God, was I gonna be that terrible of a person that you had to strike me blind? And imagine Jesus walking into that saying, no, it's not that at all. Can you imagine being his mom and dad and hearing, you didn't do anything wrong? Not that they were sinless, but it wasn't their sin that caused this. Can you imagine the relief that they felt that that man felt knowing that it wasn't because he was a bad person. It's because God wanted to show his power through him. 
And so here he makes this mud and puts it on his eyes almost as a physical symbol of his blindness. And he goes and he washes it off. And all of a sudden he opens his eyes and he can see. You think Jesus was just sitting there like, hmm. or was there a smile on his face? Was there joy in seeing this man made well? Now, why this guy? I don't know. The first thing we see about what, what the fact that we can regain sight is that it happens by God's grace. It happens by God's grace. I don't know why God chose this guy to heal. It goes back to what we saw in chapter 6 about, about a man laying by the pool of the side of it. It said God just walked up to and out of all the crippled people, out of all the people who needed him, he healed this guy. Why? Why that guy? Because he's God. And for some reason, he does what he does. And sometimes it's stuff only he knows. But the reality is God in his grace brings the sight back to blind people. See, I didn't deserve for God to save me. I didn't deserve for God to show me what was true and what was right. I, I don't deserve that more than somebody who lives in North Africa where they'll likely never have a chance to hear the gospel unless God does something incredible. There's no reason that I deserve to be born in Southwest Virginia with uh, grandparents who loved Jesus and with parents who would come to love Jesus and get to be at a church full of people who love Jesus where I'd have access to God's word. There's, there's no reason I should have had that, but by the grace of God, he did that. By the grace of God, you're here this morning or, or you have the technology to be able to watch us online and, and, and to participate and hear that there's a God in heaven who loves you. See, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 tells us this is what salvation is all about. For by grace, you are saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. The salvation you've been giving is by God's grace through faith. It's not by works. It's not like you did enough to earn it. If you've got sight today, if you've been able to see the spiritual truths of God's word and respond to them, that's because God did that. Now, we could get real deep in the weeds on a lot of different theological topics right here. We're flirting with some really big cans of worms we get up. But I hope you see clearly out of this particular passage and other places in Scripture, this guy didn't do anything that merited him getting saved or him getting healed. Jesus just did it. So whether we can ever sort out all the things about sovereignty and free will and predestination and all those kind of things, here's what you can know. If you're saved today, God did that by his grace. Not because you deserved it, not because you were better than somebody else, not because he did that because he saw you sitting on the side of the road. You were blind from birth. We're sinners from the moment we're conceived. Our hearts are turned towards sin. So the reality is all of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory, and we're sitting on the side of the road begging and having no ability to see on our own, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Yet if you're here today and Jesus has drawn you to himself, that means that there was a time when Jesus looked down and saw you in his blindness and healed you of that. It should fill you with such joy. You want to stake your identity in something about, you know, guys, we usually try to stake our identities in our jobs a lot of times. Or and ladies, a lot of times, it, it's sometimes their family that they're attempted to, you know, my kids turn out like this or that kind of thing. Listen, guys, your identity is in the fact that there's a God in heaven who loves you so much that he would die in your place and be raised from the dead so that you could have life because he is that good, not because you are. The Pharisees refused to acknowledge that they were the blind beggars sitting on the side of the road. And so even with Jesus standing right there with them, they didn't see it. But we can regain sight by God's grace. But if we do, by God's grace, you'll notice something else that's going to characterize and follow that. And that is that we can regain sight by humility. Now, I don't know about you. Spit is one of those things that's kind of gross to me. You, especially in COVID times, right? Like, this is like the thing that's the harbinger of death. And yet, can you imagine you're blind 
probably don't have the best hygiene. It's the first century. You didn't take a shower every day. And some guy walks up to you and goes, and then gets some mud out of that and smears it all over your face. How do you respond? Okay? But there was something about the way that Jesus was doing this that this man responded. You know what he did? He went and he washed it off, just like Jesus said. He could have said, what are you doing? That's disgusting. He could have said, that, that's not going to do anything. I, I, look, I've been covered in mud and spit my entire life. But in humility, he went and he washed, and he regained his sight. We see that humility again at the end of the chapter. Look there over in verse 35. Jesus heard that they'd thrown the man out. When they found him, he asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? He's ready, man. He is ready. What Jesus, whatever you tell me, sure. And he says, I'm he. And he said, absolutely, Lord. Falls at his feet and worships him. Now listen, he had just gotten kicked out of the synagogue. That means a lot of the relationships that he could have developed had gotten severed. But Jesus says, I'm the Son of Man. And he falls at his feet and he worships in humility. We even see hints of that humility in the way that the disciples said, hey, Jesus, what's going on here? They asked him a question, and then they were smart enough in this instance not to try to mouth off to Jesus about the answer. In humility, they learned. They got to see Jesus a little bit clearer. So here's the challenge for you and I today. Are you willing to be blind enough to see Jesus? Are you willing to acknowledge that on your own, you can never be good enough to get yourself to heaven and that you need Jesus to heal your eyes, to heal your heart, to make you alive? That may run against what you've understood from culture teaching you about how to be right with God. That may be different than what you've ever heard from whoever you've heard it from. But that's what God teaches us in his word. It may be that your exposure to the Bible is that it's just a list of do's and don'ts, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. Yes, there are ways we're called to live, but it's out of a response from what God's already done and the righteousness he's put in us. So are you willing to come to him today and let him make you alive, to give you sight? Now, if you're here today and you know that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord, you've trusted him for that, are there areas where you've let culture or a misunderstanding of God's word put blinders on you? Have you lost that sense of God's grace and the humility that ought to come from that? Maybe you've just allowed the cares of life to choke out what God's been doing. I want to give you just a few minutes before we go here to allow you to kind of center your heart back on who he is. I'm going to ask Daniel to come up here. And Daniel, why don't you play quietly for us a simple little chorus. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's the whole words for the chorus. You don't have to sing it, but as you're there, would you ask God that over these next few days as we're snowed in, instead of the frustration that comes with not being able to get your work done the way you'd want it to, would you just ask him to give you the eyes to look upon him, to see, to see any misunderstandings that you've picked up about how God works from the culture or ways that you've misunderstood his word and maybe drawn lines in ways you shouldn't have. Whatever you need to do, I want you to bow your head there, close your eyes just give you a moment to respond and take some time to look full in Jesus' wonderful face and trust him. I'm down front if you need to pray or talk. After a moment, I'll close this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful And
Father, the next few days of snow may disrupt our plans. Thank you for that. Thank you for the interruptions that remind us that you're bigger than we are. Help us to look to you. If there's somebody who's listened to this message today who has never genuinely placed their trust in Jesus and Savior and Lord, would you draw them to yourself in the way that only you can? and help them to see you for the first time today. If, however, like me, those who are watching or listening have made that decision to follow you, who've seen you, would you forgive us for the times we've taken our eyes off of you or we've closed our eyes to what you're doing and how you're working? Teach us from your word, but not like the Pharisees. Teach us to behold your grace, your power, your compassion, your beauty, your majesty. Not just a system of do's or don'ts. Help us to live this week in light of the life that you've given us. Thank you for all you've done. For helping us to be blind enough to see Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being with us, whether online or in person. Please be careful in the store. If you find out anybody in our church family has a need, please let your deacons or I know about it so that that way we can make sure we can do what we can. Uh, You guys stay safe, stay warm, know that we love you, and God bless you guys. Y'all are dismissed.